Hello and uh, welcome back today for something completely different. So this must be my uh, one of my ultimate favorite Japanese watches from the 60s and that is the Japanese Superjet. These, um, and especially the monocoque 150 meter rated cases. These are seriously chunky and uh, incredibly cool. And just look at that uh, massive crystal, the way it comes out of the case like that, it's uh, pretty extreme. And uh, this is the more unusual silver dial. You usually see these with the uh, kind of a black explorer dial, but this is the uh, silver dress watch dial. Let's compare this to another watch of the time period. So if we want to compare it with something, here we have a uh, Shaco Skyliner. So um, you can see the case is uh, a bit bigger. Almost the same diameter in case, but there's a mil, mil extra on the Superjet. And um, you can definitely see there's a considerable difference in thickness, especially on those lugs. And by all means, this is not a small watch uh, from this time period. So let's compare his a normal, what I would say, a more regular size citizen from the time. You can just tell that these super jets are just, just that extra little bit beefy and chunky. So, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not obese. They're not overly chunky. So I, I still can wear these. I, I um, really like them. But anyway, this one is uh, fresh out of uh, Japan and has not had a service in several decades it looks like and the is a substantial amount of dirt on the inside corrosion um, around the dial so we'll see how well this can clean up and uh, give it a full service yeah. so we'll start by removing this uh, fairly funky flex strap which uh, to be honest deserves to be cleaned up it's uh, very unusual design, I haven't seen it before and uh, I quite like it. These are a pain to clean but we'll do our best. So the first thing we're going to do is remove the strap. Hopefully we can get the spring bars out. It's always a pain when somebody uses an open, uh, you need an open end case, well, uh, you, you, you need case holes that go through like a Rolex style to use these kind of spring bars. Luckily I managed to pry this one out. It's absolutely ridiculous to fit one of these on a uh, lug where the holes don't go all the way through. Uh, one of my pet peeves. Anyway, let's see if we can get the other one off as well. Oh, that one just fell off. Because um i have yeah i don't have words um whatever someone did there oh you can see this is pretty manky but it's got very good spring to it still and it's a very cool design so yeah i'm putting this to the side now to open the case back yeah, as you might have guessed, this comes out, this is a front loader. So do not try to scratch the case back and pry this open. You're not going to get anywhere. This you got to open up from uh, the front. And how you do that is we got to find the slot around the bezel here, which somebody has placed there. Luckily, it didn't go on completely underneath the um, lug here otherwise we might have a little bit more of an issue getting it off but we're going to get this off it annoys me why people can't just line this up in a good place but there you go here we go get the case back knife on your bezel twist lift it up next we're going to um, get this inner gasket out Here we go, it's a little in fair enough condition. This 
crystal that's lifted off quite nicely, so that's nice. And here we can see the full extent of what the dial looks like. So at this point, we might as well get the hands off. Get rid of some of this muck on the dial. hands off now there is an inner gasket here just turn to dust start by removing that Oh, it's really turned to dust, hasn't it? Luckily, it seems to be coming out fairly easily. There we go. Now, I doubt this movement is just going to fall out without any uh, hassle here. That looks pretty corroded to me. Let's get rid of this before it goes everywhere. Right. So, being uh, it will have a split stem because it's a front loader. It's a good indication that our stem isn't completely rusty. That's very good. Hopefully the movement should just sort of fall out. That is not going to happen. Okay, let's see if this is fairly... This is going to come through there. What I'm doing, I'm keeping a bit of pressure here. Over the date. I did hear a little bit of a movement, Let's see what that does. Right, let's get the dial off the movement. There we go. And uh, you can see the date mechanism. Pretty funky. Dial, however, is not very funky. It's this outer ring is just caked in corrosion. I think that's a reaction it has sometimes with the outer gasket when that deteriorates. So if they've put some uh, grease with a bit of acid in it, so it's best to use stuff with no acid um that's what happens but i'm going to take this under the microscope and clean it up because this one hasn't been serviced in a long time, you can almost see the field of debris that collects uh, has been deposited on the movement around here. So now I'm going to lift off the, the uh, auto winder mechanism bridge. 
which uh, in the super jets is fully jeweled. There you go. So there's no reverser wheels in this um, movement. You just have everything kind of um, gear train based. So you have there's your locking wheel, this is the winding wheel, and this of course engages with the uh, with, with the saw on the other side. So quite a nifty little construction. So you see this spring here that is uh, fitted into um, this push this is push fitted and you have a slot to regulate so I find the best thing to do is to um, uh, get this up I will remove it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under the microscope and just uh, jig it a bit back and forth and try and lift it up because uh, this spring is very sensitive and there's no point trying to get this uh, gear train bridge on and off with um, the spring where it is. So um, yeah, I'm gonna do that now. And also if when you're cleaning the movement, you would like to get the, um, the uh, winding wheel out of place as well. So you can um, get your ratchet wheel off and yeah. Clean it as you should. So I've just uh, lifted this up under the microscope. You can see that has a little um, pinion at the bottom, which you just uh, push into the hole here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this spring on a bit of rotico underneath my uh, movement parts holder bin in order to um, prevent that from getting uh, damaged in the cleaning machine. I'm also going to uh, pick up all of this dust because there's no point putting that into my uh, cleaning fluid. In terms of finishing, everything is a little bit on the rough edge. Uh, rough side, you can see the, uh, it's basically just been smoothed off and uh, plated. So it's a nice plating. The finish is a little bit nicer on the actual base plate, but if you look at the um, if you look at the uh, gear train bridge here, it's um, yeah, it's a bit rough to be honest. It's not as fine as uh, you'd find on um, some other Citizen models, and uh, yeah, could have been nicer. But uh, there is a pretty good finish on the screw heads and. Um, I'd say they've done a nice job on the on the uh, disc that holds the um, the uh, crown wheel in place. That's uh, highly polished and uh, a fair enough finish on the ratchet wheel as well. But that said, what they have done is jewel the movement to a very high standard which is uh you know to be honest i prefer a highly jeweled movement to a highly finished movement So it's a bit annoying, but the ratchet screw is uh, it's left threaded, so you've got to be aware that you screw that out the right way, otherwise you'll break it off. Again, I would have liked to see uh, a jewel in the... Um, I would like to see some jewels for the, um, the uh, barrel over here because you've got this high jewel count, but they've kind of didn't have it where I'd really like to have it. So but besides my complaints, it's, uh, it's pretty good. So 
Now you have this uh, shock protection, which uh, I do was believe was very inspired by a Turner. And they call it the, um, they call it the Parashock system. So you have a cap jewel in a spring and you have this inner spring on the uh, on the, um, the actual shock jaw itself so it's a very efficient shock protection system and uh, design wise it reminds me very very much of the Eterna from um, the 50s and uh, up to mid 60s but, um, I don't know if they were paying any they were paying any um, paying any royalties to a Turner, I doubt it, but um, they definitely either their engineers were very like minded or they borrowed some ideas from a Turner there. I think the um, the second op option is most likely Sometimes I forget to put the um, to remove the cannon pin in, so I can only get the um, the hour wheel out after removing the uh, cannon pin, of course. Now we're going to take the uh, date mechanism apart. This movement does have a quick set, um, which is quite cool, and. Um, Which is a fairly good one as well. Bit of a funky, um, funky finish on this um, date wheel disc. the date wheel out. So, got a little bit of the corrosion here, we'll clean that up later on. So here you have the quick set lever.
So this is a push base system. You um, when you uh, pull the crown out extra hard, you will engage this lever here. Goes um, down and quick sets like so. Nice little detail is that your left-handed uh, screws are blued on the um, date side of things. Typical um, citizen feature from uh, this time period. Unfortunately, they um, they did not do that on the other side. So uh, be aware when you remove the um, ratchet wheel screw. That's also left-handed thread. Make sure that these um, make sure that the uh, dial screws don't um, fall off in the cleaning machine. I like to keep them in place. I know what they, where they are, and I put the balance back in place to keep uh, the hairspring nice and um, safe while it's in the cleaning machine. And uh, because you have uh, shock protection jewels, they've all been removed, so it's all the pivots will be nicely. It's got um, the fluid's got good access to the pivots, etc. So it's a good way of doing it. Um, yeah, that's the Superjet taken apart, and uh, now it's going to be cleaned in the cleaning machine, which is uh, badly needed. Um, I guess the last thing to do is get the mainspring out of the barrel. And people who watch the channel have noticed that I like to do this manually in a somewhat controlled fashion. There we go. In this case, we're going to reuse the mainspring as it's a fairly difficult one to get a hold of. And it seems to be in good condition.
So I have cleaned the movement and fitted the um, balance shock jewels back in place. And uh, now we can see that the balance is moving freely, which is uh, good to know later on. So when we put everything in place, um, if we have an issue with it running, we know it's not the balance. So I'll take that off now and we can start putting the gear train back into the movement. I do like the um, gold colored plating on these, brass colored or whatever you'd call it, but it's, uh, it does have a nice finish. So the finish is a bit rough, but it does have a nice color. So that's our center wheel in place. That is jeweled, which is nice. I do wish the uh, barrel, barrel arbor was jeweled on the top and bottom, but that's not the case. But it, um, we smeared some oil around there. Let's clean that up. But we, um, Luckily in this movement, it has not been worn. I've already put the um, old mainspring back into the barrel and I've greased the uh, barrel walls to allow the um, automatic mainspring to slip. And I've also greased the mainspring with the barrel, uh, mainspring uh, oil and allows it to move freely and not uh, corrode. So at this point, it's good to remember to fit our little, um, so it's not a screw in this case, but a little pusher for the setting lever to allow that to, um, so we can um, uh, release the, um, or push the setting lever down, releasing the setting, uh, the, the winding stem. Right now I, um, Going to fit the gear train. Tiny drop of oil on the contact surface of the center wheel, sweep second wheel. Like so. So I'm going to fit this under the microscope to make sure that uh, the pivots line up with the jewels as I don't want to break them while screwing down the uh, gear train bridge. 
Here we go, I've uh, lined up the uh, gear train bridge. I've also fitted one screw in order to keep it in place and I'm going to fit the two remaining screws. At this point, we can also fit the um, barrel bridge. While we're at it, we might as well fit our crown wheel. Give that a little drop of uh, oil to make sure that it um, has plenty of lubrication. Let's see. It's a very, um, quite a nice finish on the disc that holds the, um, well, the holding plate of the crown wheel. It's quite a nice finish and a nice finish on the two little screws that hold it in place as well. Considering some of the other finishes on the movement are quite rudimentary. The base plate also has some fairly decent finish um, here and there, but then again some more rudimentary finishes. Um, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a funny mix. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to oil the gear train. So I'm going to put some oil into the um, pivot holes and I'm going to flip the movement around and start putting the setting and winding mechanism in place. So what I'm going to do now is uh, oil the gear, tra gear train. So I'm going to oil the pivots here and flip it around, do it on the other side. And then we're going to start putting the setting and winding mechanism in place. So one of the tricks of oiling is not oiling too much or too little, just getting it just about right. So oil in about one third of the cup down to the pivot. So we're going to start by putting a bit of grease on the uh, sliding surfaces 
of the uh, of the uh, winding pinion and we're going to do the same on the sliding pinion then we can put the uh, we're going to put the uh, winding stem in place. This is a split stem. So we, um, as you saw earlier, while taking the movement apart. So uh, yeah, you can see how that is uh, a bit unusual. Here you have the other, the other piece. And what happens is when you push it in, it engages here. It clicks into place and um, with enough force it will come out but it should uh, should stay in place for normal action it can be a bit of a pain when you're setting the time and uh, fitting the hands etc but uh, we'll get to that a bit later So the, um, here we have the setting lever, not a screw, it's held down by a spring. And now we're going to fit the yoke. There's the yoke lever. Such. We'll put a bit of blue grease on the sliding surface. There. A little bit where the spring will come. Like so. Here we have the uh, yoke spring. We have to tension it as we put it in. Now a drop of oil on the uh, center wheel where the sliding pinion is going to go, or the cannon pinion, and a drop of oil where the um, intermediate minute wheel goes, and a drop of oil on the intermediate um, setting wheel. At this point, we can fit the um, we can fit the uh, setting lever spring. So at this point we're just going to fit the 
winding and setting mechanism and now we're going to um, after that we're going to fit the pallet fork oil it up and fit the balance and see how she runs Be a good idea to um, put the lever in the correct location like so sometimes your mind can wander it's uh, good to s keep your focus on what you're doing otherwise you'll do mistakes Now we can wind the movement with the split stem. Here we can also set it. Good. Right, let's fit the pallet fork and oil that, and then we're going to fit the balance. Now for the moment of truth, fitting the balance and see if we have a running movement. Well, that bows well. It's always satisfying to see a movement come back to life. Now let's put that on the time graph and see how she does. Okay, so um, timing wise we're not too bad, amplitude we're not too bad, but the beat area is a bit off, so I'm going to adjust that now. And unfortunately it's not uh, adjustable on the balance cock, so I'll have to take the balance off and adjust it on the collet. So what you do when you're adjusting the collet is you need to get access to the collet. So you go in between the hairspring springs and uh, you take a screwdriver to the little slot in the collet and you, you twist it either clockwise or counterclockwise depending on which direction you're adjusting the beat error. So at this point I've adjusted it clockwise and let's see what it does. Okay, a few attempts of uh, adjusting the beat error, 0 0.3, I'm happy with that. 233 amplitude is uh, not amazing, but uh, that's okay on this movement. Um, when the auto mechanism is in place, the amplitude tends to rise a bit. So this is dial down, turn around to dial up. And we're now going plus one second, 232 amplitude. So that's pretty good. I'm not too, um, that's a nice uh, positional variation on dial up and dial down. Two thirty seven. that's good. Now let's do a uh, crown down position. A 
that's not bad at all, to be honest. Um, the positional variations are more than acceptable on this watch. So we're probably going minus 10 on dial down. Now the crown down, so crown up. very good. This uh, watch is definitely going to keep a uh, fairly decent time when put back together, so happy with that. Now we know the watch is performing fairly well, we can start putting the uh, auto mechanism back into place. So we can start with this uh, spring. which is push fit. So I'm just going to use my screwdriver in the slot to push it in place. As such, and then we can start putting in the, um, the auto winder wheels as well. So at this point I'm going to pre-oil the lower jewels for the auto winder wheels. We can see the driving wheel. Give that pushing uh, drop of oil as well. So here we got the um, auto winder mechanism bridge. Uh, we're just going to secure that in place now. And then uh, we're going to uh, put the, uh, the uh, date mechanism in place. And then I'll finish off by putting the uh, rotor back on, because I really don't want to um, have the rotor on while I'm dealing with the uh, 
date mechanism. I should maybe done, I should have done that first, but sometimes you get things in the wrong order. Now we can see that is working. And um, yeah, that's going to wind a movement as the um, inner teeth of the oscillating weight turns this intermediate wheel here. That goes, engages either with the wheel to the left or to the right. That engages with this uh, intermediate wheel here and then the driving wheel. Right, let's get the date, date mechanism and quick set mechanism in place and uh, get the dial and hands on and case this watch. There's a little cap jewel, lower cap jewel on the uh, palette, which I didn't fit earlier on, but Might as well do that now. That goes there. It has a little uh, spring, the spring here. It helps reset it or keep it out of position when it's not being engaged. So that's in place. What we can do now is just to see if that lever will engage properly. There we go. Oops. Yeah, you can see how that works. Pull the crown out and it will engage with a quick set. Excellent. Might as well put a little bit of grease on the surface where that might slide, just to give it a little bit of lubrication in case it was to touch. Next, we can fit the date change wheels.
that's the left hand screw as you remember that's blue you see that on the next generation of citizen movements they did that as well very nice touch At this point, we can fit the date disc. have the slightly fiddly task of fitting the because there's no real there's no real um, slot for the state disk to go in when I'm putting the um, date change uh, tension spring in it wants to move with it so I'm gonna to have to hold this in place while I'm getting this in and let's see if we can move it like this Here we go, you can see that spring's tension in there. Now we're going to get the bridge over. I must say, Citizen are very good at making very fiddly date change tension springs. The Citizen Homer, you also have to do something similar to this to make it uh, work. Once you do a few, you get the knack of it and it's not a big problem anymore. But for the first time around, it could be a real, it can be a real fiddly job. So all I need to do now is get the first screw down and I can let go of the um, date, date uh, disc bridge. There we go. Good stuff. Now I'm going to flip the uh, I'm going to flip the movement around and we can fit that cool oscillating weight.
Let's get the uh, this uh, funky oscillating weight back onto the movement. There's a couple of different variations of uh, these. Some held in place with individual taps to go in, or um, yeah, clamps. And this one has an inbuilt inner ring clamp ring. So we have uh, a screw which is shorter that goes up here by the by the uh, by the uh, <laughs> ratchet ratchet wheel side. That screws down like so, and we have two slightly longer screws that are the same that go in over here by the balance. This has to be one of my favorite unusual movements, well, unusual in the terms that it's a very different design. I do believe they had uh, inspiration from some of the Swiss manufacturers in, that were experimenting with this in the uh, 50s, but never got any further than the experimenta experimentation phase. But uh, Citizen definitely went all the way and mass produced these movements. And um, the 39 Joule is probably the best one to get because you'll have your extra jeweling, uh, which is nice because for sometimes the lower jewels will, you will have wear in the upper bushings, uh, but this is um, fully jeweled here, so very nice, very funky, and as we saw, it's a fairly accurate version of this movement as well, so it's it's cool. It's not the most silent of auto winders. Let's turn the uh, microscope off, you can hear that. I guess it's fine, but it's uh, the later Citizen automatic that came out of this, which uh, definitely is one of my favorite uh, Japanese movements, uh, was way more refined and efficient, but uh, not as cool as the Superjet. I do believe these movements started to come out in 1962, and uh, I guess that's in the middle of the uh, jet age. So anyway, let's get the dial back onto this movement and uh, case it. I guess it's time for the grand reveal of how the dial turned out. That is my best effort of cleaning off all the corrosion on the um, outer ring. I believe that is created by some acid in uh, silicon that they used on their gaskets. So sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. I don't know what the key factors for that is, but I do believe um, it comes down to what kind of um, of uh, gasket lubrication they used when the watch was new, or perhaps when it was serviced at some point. I doubt the factory used something that would have had uh, acid in it because good condition ones uh, don't have it. So I doubt the factory would have um, done that. So it must've been something, some, some of the uh, watchmakers used back in the day that could have had that effect. So what I'm going to do in this case is put the movement into um, the case and um, then fit the hands because um, setting the time 
with a split stem can be a real pain. So I prefer doing that while it's in its case. Like I said, we'll keep the tube where it should be. So one last look at the movement. There we go, there's the um, split step put back together. I'm going to um, put the hands on while the movement's in the case because that allows me to um, set it easily. Okay, let's see how the date is lining up now. Very good, that's where I want it. Pretty much within 30 seconds, perfect. So I find that all these um, second hands are shorter than the minute hand, but that's just the way they are. They're all like this, so that's fairly common. Excellent. I'm going to clean up the dial a bit. So now I'm going to fit the um, crystal. I've got a new crystal, a reproduction one. It comes up like this. And then we have, uh, so you have one gasket pressing up against the case and the crystal. And we'll have one gasket keeping the uh, crystal in place also. After that, it's time to fit the bezel. And as always, I'm going to 
make sure the notch on the bezel is uh, going out to counter to the crown because I like to have it at a good accessible point. And now we're going to press this together. Right, let's set the uh, time. It is now, it is 2.27. It is the second. So to use the quick set, we're going to pull the crown out like so. There we go, second. Yeah. That's it. I enjoyed working on this movement. It's very funky. I like the way the watch was transformed from something that uh, looked like it should be in the junk drawer to something that could look uh, perfectly well on the showroom. Hope you enjoyed the video and until next time, have a good one.